Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Gallery. My name is uh, Christine Riding. I'm head of the curatorial department here at the National Gallery, and I'm going to talk to you today about Thomas Gainsborough's The Morning Walk, or more specifically, Mr. and Mrs. William Pallet, which was actually painted in 1785. So we've got half an hour to unpack this particular work of art, and I'm going to do it in three stages. Firstly, I'm going to talk about British art here at the National Gallery and Thomas Gainsborough's position within that representation. I'm then going to move on to Thomas Gainsborough's career and how this painting sits in his career as a whole, which uh, he was born in 1727 and died in 1788. So the significance of his career, both in terms of British art more broadly, but also in terms of him as an artist, I will talk about in that second stage. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about artistic ambition. I'm gonna talk about artistic rivalries, because very famously, of course, Gainsborough was a great rival of Joshua Reynolds but also talk about how we can think about this painting in the context of an artist's ambition within the context of the tradition of European painting, and more particularly about the old masters and how the old masters actually influenced the way that Thomas Gainsborough thought, the way that he presented his work of art, and the way that his work actually developed over his career until his death, as I said, in 1788. And then I'm gonna finish on a quote because I'm gonna end on talking about the title, The Morning Walk, and where that came Came from and the kind of significance one can think about in the context of a portrait which after all is meant to be about a specific human being or human beings as we have represented here but how eventually the portrait can become um, idealized or generalized to the extent that in some senses it doesn't really matter who the sitter is because it's a work of art itself and I think the title Morning Walk which comes into play much later after the creation of this work of art actually indicates the kind of power of this kind of grand manner portrait and how one can think about therefore Gainsborough's ambitions in the time, type of creation of this work of art in terms of uh, British art going forward into the 19th, 20th century and 21st century. But the first thing I want to say about this type of portrait in the context of the National Gallery is really about the history of the National Gallery itself, which was actually begun in 1824. Now to us that might seem a very long time ago and in fact in 2024 it'd be 200 years ago but actually British art in the context of the National Gallery once it was set up in 1824 actually has a very special status because a lot of the artists in this room hadn't long been dead or indeed were still alive when the National Gallery was set up and their works of art actually came into the collections occasionally when they were contemporary artists. So we might look at this and think of it as, as is often said in the context of uh, paintings that go from William Hogarth through to JMW Turner, the golden age of British art. We need to think about this much more in the context of modern and contemporary art when this institution was being set up. We also need to think about the National Gallery in the context of the creation of the Royal Academy in 17. 68, which after all was all about the status of contemporary art um, the, and the, the Royal Academy had a unique position in British culture because it offered two things. Number one, it trained artists and number two, it gave artists the opportunity to exhibit their works in a contemporary art context and indeed I'm sure a number of you have been to the Royal Academy summer, summer, um, summer show, that's exactly the kind of contemporary art show I'm talking about but we're going right back to the 18th century. So I think it'd be fun to think about this painting in the context, not of the old masters, not in terms of the golden age of British art, but thinking about it as living, breathing artists who want to establish a career and reputation in a living, breathing world of London and the United Kingdom in the 18th century itself. So how do we position this painting in that context? So around you, you'll see what I've referred to before as the, the, the golden age of British art. The collection here at the National Gallery on the whole runs from William, Hog um, William Hogarth is often seen as the father of British art. That's actually rather anachronistic. And any of you that went to the National Portrait Gallery see a wonderful exhibition of Nicholas Hilliard would know that you know, British born artists were establishing major careers at the court, for example, of Elizabeth I, well beyond William Hogarth. And actually thinking about the 17th century, William Dobson is another British born artist who established himself um, during the period that we normally think of in terms of Van Dyck 
and Rubens and other artists from continental Europe who came to London especially to establish or, or further their careers. So on the one hand, the presence of the British art collection here in some senses is a sort of good news story about the establishment and the desire for um, a British art scene that was much more recalibrated to be balanced in terms of the, the art, where the artists actually came from. That you could have British born artists who had equal status to the kind of other artists that you would like the Van Dykes of this world, where you could actually establish a reputation, where you could have clients, where you could have a successful career, and equally like the likes of Van Dyke, who was an absolute totemic artist in the 18th and 19th century, not only could you be financially successful, but obviously Van Dyke was also knighted. So the thing about the Royal Academy is that it actually gave artists a social status, because whether they were knighted or not, they could still put RA at the end of their names. They were Royal Academicians. They were part of an elite group of artists who progressively, as the 18th century went on, actually became much less um, um, focused on Brit um, artists from the continent and much more focused on British-born artists. Now, I'm not sure if that's necessarily a good thing or not. I think when the Academy was set up in 1768, to have so many European artists as part of the mix, including two women artists of um, Swiss heritage, Angelica Kaufman and Mary Moser, you have to get well into the th uh, 20th century before you see another female Royal Academician, by the way, so good on the 18th century boo to the 19th century, um, is actually that mix of, of, of continental artists, of contemporary art in a kind of international context rather than necessarily just being about British art, I think actually gave the British art scene its um, particular unique flavour, should we say, and I think that sort of interaction between the continent of Britain and of course eventually North America, because the first president of the Royal Academy was Joshua Reynolds, uh, Thomas Gainsborough's great rival, but the second one was American, Benjamin West. And the third, of course, was Thomas Lawrence. And both Reynolds and Lawrence were knighted. So you can see the sort of why people were so keen on the idea of a Royal Academy in 1768. And I just want to point out one work of art that was actually created in that year, which is Wright of Derby's experiment with the air pump, 1768. That's an incredibly ambitious work of art for a British artist of this period. So really what we're talking about is this kind of groundswell of, of excitement and interest in art that's created in Britain rather than necessarily always importing in the old masters or necessarily patronizing artists who are based in Paris and elsewhere. So this is, this is the kind of world that Thomas Gainsborough is coming from. So just to point out a couple of things in terms of the actual um, development of the collection here at the uh, National Gallery. For example, that painting over there, the market cart, which was painted by Gainsborough in 1786, that came into the National Gallery's collection. It was a gift from the governors of the British institution in 1830, only you know, within six years of the creation of the National Gallery itself. And, and Gainsborough had only been dead, you know what, so just nearly 40 years. So he was very much a kind of, I suppose it'd be like getting a gift of a, a Paul Nash or, um, you, know, a, a sort of, you know, Lucian Freud or something. These are artists that were not, they were still in people's memories when they were coming into the permanent collection of old masters as represented by the National Gallery. And an artist who was still alive at the time that a painting came into the collection is John Constable, who is directly related, of course, not just in terms of geography, they're both from Suffolk, uh, Thomas Gainsborough, and uh, John Constable, and both really were passionate about landscape, which I'll come back to in a moment. But the cornfield over there was actually donated in the year of Constable's death in 1837, so that was a piece of contemporary art. I know it graces lots of chocolate boxes and biscuit tins and all the rest of it, but that was cutting-edge contemporary art at the time it came into collection, as indeed really was that. That was a very powerful signifier, as indeed this painting, um, which only came into the collections in the middle of the 20th century, this kind of painting was an incredibly powerful signifier of the establishment of a British school of art, of ambitious, that responded both to the vagaries of the British art market, which I'll come on to in a moment, but also responded for the desire for old masters and also the training and inspiration that one can get from art, whether contemporary or historic, in terms of, of British culture. So it really is tremendously important in terms of the way that British art actually operates within the context of the collection, both from 1824 and today.
So talking very specifically about Thomas Gainsborough, he was, as I said, born in 1727 in Sudbury, Suffolk. Has anyone been to the Gainsborough's house in Sudbury, Suffolk? Absolutely worth a trip. I think actually when you see Sudbury, Suffolk and actually the area itself, you can sort of see the mindset of an artist like Thomas Gainsborough and indeed John Constable in terms of the kind of art that they create. And there's absolutely no doubt that um, Gainsborough's great, great passion was landscape. But the problem with landscape is the fact that despite the fact that when you look at this room, when you look at fighting Temeraire, you know, um, Ulysses deriding Polyphemus, the hay wain, the cornfield. I mean, to us now, we think of that genre as being absolutely quintessentially English, if not British. That is not true of when Gainsborough was a, was a young um, artist. It was a, a genre that had to establish itself in terms of a native tradition. It was one that was almost entirely dependent on old masters coming in, especially from the 16th and 17th centuries. And the big guns of landscape in terms of the market in the 18th century, as far as patrons are concerned, were the likes of Claude Lorraine and Salvatore Rosa. These are these are um, artists that were working in Rome, whether they be Italian or French. And this is very much part, as you probably all know, about the idea of the Grand Tour and the way that the Grand Tour actually had a huge impact on taste and culture in this country in the 18th century. Indeed, William Hallett actually was fresh off a Grand Tour of two years when he married uh, Elizabeth, um, which is obviously what this portrait is essentially about. He'd been away for two years and only the super wealthy really could afford to go away for two years wandering around France and especially Italy. And the locus classicus of the Grand Tour was Rome. That's where you engage with the ancient past. It's where you engage with the Renaissance. It's, it's also where there was a big community of European artists ready to feed the burgeoning patronage of these kind of tourists in terms of the kind of work that they were taking back. So British artists have to respond. If they want to live and breathe, they've got to respond to, to these bigger cultural um, changes. So what kind of world did Thomas Gainsborough get born into? So he's born in, as I say, Sudbury, Suffolk. Um, his father is actually a milliner and a clothier, and he eventually becomes a postmaster. And this is absolute classic background for a British artist of the 18th century. They're coming really from a kind of lower middle class level, also an artisan class. So, for example, you know, Ford Wine to 1775 with the birth of J.M.W. Turner in Maiden Lane just down the road here in London. His father is, is, a, is a wig maker and a barber. I mean, these people aren't coming from illustrious backgrounds, but they are nonetheless coming from the kind of world that's going to be interested in art and art training. So perhaps unsurprisingly, his father um, um, actually sends him off to London at the age of 14, and he is then immersed in the London art scene of William Hogarth, of other artists like Joseph Highmore, and you know, British artists, but also an international crowd of artists. And he goes into the studio of Hubert Gravelo, who is a French artist, very much in, in a part of that cosmopolitan scene of London in the period. And we're actually talking about this area of London. If you, if you re remind yourself that actually the National Gallery used to be the Royal Muse, Trafalgar Square didn't exist, it was Charing Cross, in fact, that's what people referred to this area. This area was the centre of luxury trades. This is where to um, Chippendale, for example, set himself up. This is where the artists actually were. This is, this is where the wealthy came to select their interiors and their works of art and so on. So this is the hub of the luxury and artistic world is the moment that Gainsborough comes to London. That's obviously the reason why his father sends him here. So he's engaging with what was called a very loose affiliation of artists and academy called the St. Martin's Lane Academy, one of a number of things that were set up by both British-born and European artists in order to sort of ignite enthusiasm and discussions between artists and budding artists in the London art world in a way that just did not exist um, elsewhere in the United Kingdom and indeed nothing like the kind of state patronage that you would have got in Paris and, and often you get British artists looking longingly across the channel at what was going on in terms of state patronage not just in terms of training with the Académie Française but also these lovely big Catholic churches and palaces that needed to be filled with works of art and they're sort of the, the, the absolute classic there of course would be uh, Louis XIV and Versailles. So there weren't the opportunities, but the young Gainsborough coming into that kind of almost self-help group, the enlightened self-interest of the artistic scene, actually came across contemporary French art. He came across Dutch art. So if you go in the adjoining room next door and have a look at Conard Wood from 1748, that is essentially a Dutch work of art or Dutch-inspired work of art, but in the English landscape. 
And I think this is what Gainsborough is particularly good at, is translating the old master tradition, but very much anchored in what people could recognize as an English country idyll. And you can see this here in this painting. So he's in the mirror of um, uh, William Hogarth and other artists, very cosmopolitan, very international. People often talk about the first half of the 18th century in England and London as being a backwater. It wasn't, it was a crossroads. If artists weren't going to make a living, if they weren't opportunities, they wouldn't have come to London. But artists did come to London in the way that Van Dyck and Rubens came to London in the previous century. There were fortunes to be made, there was a, there was a patronage to be gleaned, and the, the, you know, there were opportunities. So I think that's really what would have inspired Thomas Gainsborough at that time. In 1746, he marries at the age of 19 his wife Margaret. He has two children, Mary and Margaret, and we have two wonderful portraits by him of his daughters, one next door. Uh, from the 1750s and he goes back to Sudbury and starts creating works of art for example like uh, Mr and Mrs Andrews which we have hanging on the wall next door which is dated about 1750 and actually looking at Mr and Mrs Andrews in conjunction with the Morning World Walk with Mr and Mrs Hallett is actually quite illuminating because that is an actual portrait of two individuals who own the estate they're sitting in and you can look at the blades of grass and you can see the different types of uh, farming that they're bringing, these kind of revolutionary methods of farming that this particular landowner, um, Robert Andrew, actually brought to his estate. It's very specific, very particular and very English. Fast forward several decades, this painting who knows where it is? Um, who knows why they're walking in the landscape? We don't get any great sense that they own this landscape at all. They are simply walking around. And that sort of transformation from something that's very specific to something that's much more anchored in the cult of sensibility that comes to play in the second half of the 18th century is very much where this painting is coming from. So what is going on in terms of that transition? So Gainsborough goes back to Sudbury, he then moves to Ipswich, and then he makes a key decision in terms of what he's going to do in terms of his career. He moves to Bath. Now, anyone that knows their Jane Austen knows that Bath was a, a spa town, very fashionable, lots of people went there, including people from London, of course. So rather than grapple with the ever-growing art world in London and have immediate rivals that you may or may not be able to square up to, um, Gainsborough goes to Bath because he knows there's opportunities there, but he can really sharpen his intellect, sharpen his skills and so on, and he goes there in 1759. So he's really thinking through what his next career move is going to be, and he stays in Bath for 14 years. And it's in Bath he creates that painting just down there of Dr. Um, um, Schomburg, uh, what's his first name? Rafe Schomburg, which was painted about 1760 at the time when he's arrived in Bath. Now, the transformation in Bath is a way, actually, I think, away from these relatively small-scale works of art, the conversation pieces, the small-scale portraits and so on that very much mark the first part of his career, into these much more ambitious, large-scale, full-length portraits that are much more in keeping with the kind of tradition of old master um, um, portraiture. And, of course, Van Dyck looms large in this context. You can see him with his growing ambition just in terms of the sheer scale of the portraits that he's doing. And this is very much a part of, of the, uh, this particular painting's power, is its scale. It's much more ambitious much more aligned. I mean, you can imagine a full length by Van Dyck sitting here quite cheerfully in terms of its scale, its ambition, but also the scale of the figures and the kind of idealization that he's bringing to bear in terms of the representation itself. And it's absolutely in Bath. He's seen Van Dyck in London, but it's in Bath that Gainsborough really engages with Van Dyck. And Van Dyck to him, although he's interested in artists like Velázquez and Murillo, this is the opening salvos of interest in Spanish art, in Dutch art like Ten Years and uh, Rubens, for example, and a huge figure in terms of a painting that unfortunately is not there because it's under examination, but the watering place, um, which was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1777, that was a direct response to the Rubens watering place that we actually have in our collections. So it was a, a kind of English version, if you like, of Rubens' uh, painting. But it was Van Dyck that really did underline the kind of status, the success of many artists, not just Gainsborough, indeed, in Leicester Fields, just around the corner from here, where many artists lived, including William Hogarth, he put a golden bust of Van Dyck above his door, because that's what people were supposed to think about as they went through. 
not necessarily the artist of marriage à la mode, but an artist of ambition who wants status in a similar vein to Van Dyck. So certainly Gainsborough looked very closely at Van Dyck, not just in terms of composition, but also in terms of technique. Because actually, of all the artists of the 18th century, I think most closely resembled the technique of Van Dyck, it was Gainsborough, and he modelled himself very particularly on him. So eventually, um, Gainsborough decides that he is going to come back to London, and he comes back in 1774. Now, this is at a moment after the creation of the Royal Academy in 1768, when he's already falling out with the Royal Academy, and this is all about the positioning of his works of art. Now, on the one hand, it's tremendously exciting that there's this annual exhibition, uh, the major event of contemporary art going on on an annual basis where artists can submit their works of art and actually literally vie for attention with a crowd of people who've paid their shilling to come through the door and have reviews in newspapers and all this kind of stuff. The only problem is that you can only guide exactly what happens to your painting once it comes into the space literally in the hope that the hanging committee, as they were called, which would be led by the likes of Joshua Reynolds, Gainsborough's rival, is where they're going to put your works of art. Are they going to be in a prominent position? Are they going to be in a position where you can see them properly? Are they going to be juxtaposed with something that's going to kill off your work of art? I mean, to be honest, I wouldn't fancy being next to the um, experiment with the air pump if I had a tiny, subtle work of art sitting next to that. I think you'd be blown out of the water, frankly. And Gainsborough's technique was much more subtle than many other artists. And the, the exciting thing about the creation of the Royal Academy and these annual exhibitions is it really pumped up the London art scene. On the other, it did, it, you did have artists actually creating works of art specifically for the exhibition. And Reynolds was contin continually complained about because he heightened the colour of his paintings that would then fly away, as the reviewers would say. In other words, they start fading almost immediately in order for them to have wall power in the context of the Royal Academy annual exhibition. So in that context, um, technique that is more subtle, more feathery, more playful, is actually going to have quite, quite a hard time in that very robust, sort of um, high octane world of the um, um, uh, contemporary exhibition. And Gainsborough really didn't feel that his paintings were, given his status at this point, at the creation of the Royal Academy, his, his paintings weren't being actually exhibited in the way that was fair to his works of art. So he withdrew in the 1770s and exhibited in his house in Schomburg House, which is still exists down Pall Mall. If you're walking down towards St James's Palace, walk past the um, uh, Travellers and the Reform Club, and on the left-hand side is a very strange 17th century house. That's where Gainsborough lived, so very prominently central, just around the corner from the National Gallery where we are now and he exhibited his works in that house. He also falls out with the Royal Academy in the 1780s as well, to the extent that this painting, which would absolutely have been worthy of a Royal Academy exhibition, actually isn't exhibited there. It's exhibited in Schomburg House, as indeed is that fabulous portrait of Sarah Siddons painted in the same year. That too was exhibited in the artist's house. Now, obviously not as prominent, as an annual exhibition, but nonetheless, artist studios and houses were becoming increasingly the places to go to as a kind of genteel kind of pastime, as well as a way of seeing contemporary art in a different context. But at that point, Gainsborough's had enough of the Royal Academy, and he dies in 1788, having never exhibited there again. So the last bit I wanted to talk about, really, is about um, Gainsborough as, a, as an artist sitting in the context of um, um, the British art scene of that period but also about the way that um, Gainsborough operated in the context of the old master tradition. So just delving into this painting a little bit more We've um, talked about the fact that uh, Gainsborough really wanted to be a landscape painter. That was his real passion. He was absolutely an exemplar for the likes of John Constable at a moment when landscape really wasn't achieving much purchase in terms of the British market. So what he would do in terms of the annual exhibitions when he was exhibiting was actually exhibit many more portraits, many of which were commissioned. In other words, he was going to be paid for them. And double portraits like this, he would have been paid 120 guineas, which is about 126 pounds, which is an enormous sum of money. Um, a single portrait would be about 100 guineas, about 105 um, pounds. And actually, the dog apparently was just chucked in for good measure. But if he had a horse, that would be additional as well. So presumably, just because it's a small creature, it's fine. Um, 
So there was lots of money to be made in portraiture, but not in landscape. And every exhibited landscape by Gainsborough was speculative. In other words, he didn't have a buyer when he made it, but he was hoping, teasing the market a little bit to see what might fly eventually. And I think really the battle that um, Gainsborough fought and other people who were interested in landscape, the battle that he fought by the end of his career in 1788, absolutely made way for the likes of Turner and Constable going on into the late 18th, early 19th century. Really, it's him and other artists like him testing the market the entire time that really established an interest in British contemporary landscape at a moment when it really didn't have a market. So then going back to this kind of painting, therefore, I suppose what you could summarise by saying is actually that he knew that he would make money out of portraiture. He was extremely good at it. He had a certain way of doing portraiture that was actually on some level very different from Joshua Reynolds, his great rival. But on the other hand, it always signalled something higher, if you like, than just the simple fact of the individual standing here. But we've got to tease out those subtleties a bit more than you would, for example, with a Reynolds portrait with someone histrionically gesturing in a classical robe, you know, an actress or something, where it's pretty clear that you're using the profession of acting and actors to elevate your portrait towards history painting, which during the entire 18th century was deemed to be the highest form of art. You know, this is what artists were aspiring to. It was the most intellectual, the most idealised, the most strenuous, both physically and um, um, in aesthetic terms. So pushing portraiture, which can be sold towards that elevation of art, towards the idea of history painting. And with Gainsborough, he really it wasn't interested in, in really melding the classical or the Renaissance with a person that was literally going to walk out the room out and have a cup of tea. I mean, he really thought that that was just bonkers. But what you could do with the old masters, which actually Turner does with the Fighting Temeraire much later, is use the Claudian sunsets, use the link to Van Dyke, use the kind of scale and composition, but position these people in their own time update the old master tradition, learn from it, get inspired by it, reinvigorate it, use it to take your art forward, but don't mimic it, don't pastiche it, that's really not where you're going with it. And that's exactly what he's doing here. So for example, you do have the Claudian sunset. We don't know where it is, it's just this kind of English idyll or British idyll. It could be anywhere, but they're walking in a, a kind of landscape actually that become tremendously fashionable. I mean, actually, when you think that Capability Brown only died in 1783, five years before Gainsborough, he was responsible for about 170 parklands that were sort of gardens but not. I mean, they were meant to look entirely natural despite the fact that they were entirely artificial. So in some senses, this is mirroring the trend in the second half of the 18th century towards the idea of a kind of natural landscape that the British people would walk through as a kind of parallel with the ideas of English liberty. Not these weird gardens that kind of, you know, sort of, you know, hemmed in, hedged and cut within an inch of their lives in all these different shapes that one got on the continent, for example, in France, but rather these kind of undulating hills where nature seems to have been kissed by God kind of thing, but it wasn't, it was actually Capability Brown. So it's more, it's more about the kind of naturalism and yet so artificial, which actually in some senses underlines why this is such a fashionable painting. And then just in terms of the actual figures themselves, um, this juxtaposition of black and white, this idea of the sunset and the light coming from her, her ivory-coloured silk dress on the left-hand side, with this lovely echo of the uh, kind of great green um, um, bow that's actually at her breast, which is mirrored up in the hat. The hat is black with the white um, ostrich feathers, very similar to the hat that Mrs Siddons is wearing over there. Very, very fashionable, but also very flamboyant. But also because of this kind of mistiness of it, the mistiness of the uh, kerchief around her to her breast around the, the, the way that he's actually painted so you can actually see the ground grinning through. You can actually see what this, the base colour of this painting because he's, he's kind of used such sketchiness in terms of the sort of vibrancy of the uh, techniques and the way that her dress actually melds into the Pomeranian dog as if they're one with each other, these kind of natural uh, creatures and then the way that melds into the background. This is, and then on the other side you have him in the, impos I mean no one wears this in the countryside by the way, um, in this sort of um, silk black velvet um, frock suit um, with his hand, you know, holding onto the hat and his hand in his top here. Again, this juxtaposition of black and white with the black, uh, white accents here. He has his hair powdered, which you wouldn't have in the countryside. You would have your hair natural. 
Um, so in fact, it is thought that this is a wedding portrait, that they are wedding, wearing the outfits that they would have worn at their wedding in July 1785. But I think what's really clever about this painting is this kind of warmness that you see in the background, and then this juxtaposition of white and black either side are kind of like negatives of each other in terms of the actual composition itself. Now, has, can anyone think of a very famous painting by Gainsborough that utilizes the very stark contrast between a single color in the center and the warm landscape around it that is very famous in the present day? The Blue Boy. So this idea of this Van Dyckian figure, which actually now is now known to be actually his nephew, um, Gainsborough Dupont actually stepping out of a warm Claudian landscape in this single blue colour, which is so striking in that particular painting, actually being juxtaposed here in his representation of Mr. and Mrs. Hallett. So, um, and, and just, just going back, to, I mean, if you look at the arches here, this is a Henry Rayburn uh, painting. That's more the sort of thing you'd wear in the countryside. You'd be wearing your drabs and your browns and plain woolen outfits. You wouldn't um, um, dust your hair. You wouldn't be wearing wigs. I mean, Dr. Schomburg's only wearing a wig because he's a doctor and doctors, professionals wore wigs, even though they were completely out of fashion by the time we get to the latter part of the 18th century. So this is a kind of artificial portrait in the sense that you wouldn't expect to see these two wandering around an English idyll in these kind of clothes. But nonetheless, I think it's a juxtaposition, the idea of the cult of sensibility, the idea of nature, the idea of liberty, all these kind of political, social and cultural contexts that are brought to bear in terms of the power of this painting. So I just want to sort of move on to the fact that this, I just very briefly, this idea of Gainsborough and the old master tradition. I mean, I think probably many of you might have looked at this painting and thought, ah, oh, it's just a portrait of two people. It's rather grand, it's rather lovely, but hey ho. Um, the thing is, I think the subtlety of the way that Gainsborough utilises the old masters does need teasing out because actually it's part of his ambition as an artist that he can persuade you that he's part of the tradition of the old masters, not pastiching it or avoiding it. He's actually engaging with it. So I think what, what we have here is actually, as I said before, a portrait that could sit very cheerfully next to a Van Dyck. It could also sit very cheerfully in, next to a Thomas Lawrence. And in fact, we've got, that's an artist who's the third president of the Royal Academy from the first part. I mean, he, he comes to prominence in the 1790s, learning very much from Gainsborough. There's a wonderful portrait next door in his early career of Queen Charlotte, the same shimmering technique, the same interest in Van Dyck, clearly the heir to Gainsborough, not actually Reynolds, I don't think in that particular instance. You could forward wine to Whistler, you could forward wine to Sargent, you could go into the 20th century and think about how these artists are playing off each other. I mean, when you look at a Whistler, you know it's a Whistler, but you can also see Van Dyck, you can see Gainsborough, you can see Reynolds, you can see all these artists that these artists are learning from in a kind of lineage, but updating the tradition that they're engaging with to, to create a contemporary work of art. But I just want to refer, therefore, to the uh, title, as my last point, The Morning Walk. So this is not a title that the painting had in the 18th century. Indeed, if this had been exhibited, it would have been exhibited under the title of Lady and Gentleman in a Landscape. I mean, you know, most of the time, unless you knew it was Sarah Siddons, you wouldn't necessarily recognize the people unless you knew them. But going back to the whole issue about portraiture, about being a specific individual, over time, if we didn't know this was Mr. and Mrs. Hallett, how do we actually engage with this as a painting? Do we just accept that this is some, a couple who have since died? Or do we think of it as a work of art and how are we supposed to appreciate it? So just to give you an example of the way that, um, in many ways, these kind of grand manner paintings are a kind of glorious fiction, or at least that human beings that can be gorgeous and young at one point may not always be gorgeous and wonderful as they get older, because um, 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 William Hallett, one of his, his great um, sort of vice was in fact um, horse racing. So this is what this reviewer is referring to um, in the Times, and this was during an exhibition in the 1850s, 1859, at the British Institution when this painting was on display. And, um, and William Hallett had only died in the early part of the 1840s, so in fact everyone remembered him when they were looking at these paintings, and I quote the reviewer. Mr. Hallett is only known to fame as a patron of the turf, as he is here presented, it would be difficult to conceive a more perfect realization of youthful elegance and high breeding. He is worthy of the sweet young woman who wears the budding honors of wifedom with such pretty pride, her hand resting with a fond and confiding pressure on her new husband's arm. 
happy young couple to be handed down to posterity before the world had withered the young wife's roses, before the turf and the bottle has soured the husband's brow and reddened his nose, or the gout stiffened and swelled those shapely legs of his. So in some senses, the idea, I think, that, it, that it, you can see how you're now moving out of the specific work of art, because in some senses, they're recognising that this is an individual who perhaps didn't look like this when they died a couple of years earlier. But also the power of this kind of portrait, this kind of moment when people are beautiful, young, idyllic, wandering through these landscapes. And this is where I think the title Morning Walk comes in, in the way that the blue boy is a portrait of, of Gainsborough's nephew, but we all refer to it as the blue boy. So it becomes more than a portrait of an individual. It becomes a kind of manifesto for art. And indeed, I'm personally of the opinion when the blue boy was exhibited in the Manchester Art Treasures exhibition of 1857, which incidentally Whistler went specifically to see, almost immediately within years, he's using phrases like the white girl or symphony in white. Why does he start focusing on the idea of color and I think the blue boy, because of the title, draws you into thinking of the painting as beyond a specific representation of an individual. It becomes this uber work of art. And I think the title Morning Walk allows you to think of this portrait as actually not a, as just a portrait, but as a work of art. So where did the title Morning Walk come from? It actually came at the moment when the painting was sold out of the Hallett family and to the Rothschilds in the 1880s. And it's thought to come through with this tradition in British art of exhibiting paintings with lines from poetry. In the 18th century, it could be Shakespeare, it could be Milton, and actually a very popular poem, in fact, was James Thompson's The Seasons. And Summer has these lines, and I quote, when every muse and every blooming pleasure wait without to bless the wildly devious morning walk. And that, we think, is where it came from. Thank you.